I'm back in KiCad with the add submodule of our RISC-V ALU. The ALU needs to be able to take its result from multiple sources, not just from the add as sum output. We also need to implement the other arithmetic and logic operations like AND and OR and the left and right shift operations. So I need some way to disable the adder output when we're performing these other operations. I can do this with a tri-state buffer. And I've got here the 74HCT245 octal bus transceiver with tri-state outputs. Now this is a transceiver, that means that it can both transmit and receive. In other words, it can send the data in both directions. If we look down to the schematic here, we can see that there is a, a direction input. Uh, there's also an A terminal and a B terminal. And I just want A to always be input and B to always be output. Looking at the schematic here, we can see that by setting the direction input high, an input to A will pass through to the output at B. So we're enabling this AND gate, which will enable this tri-state buffer, but this AND gate will be disabled. Notice that we will have a low coming in here because our DIR input, our direction input here is inverted, so this AND gate will be disabled. With this one disabled, then we will have this tri-state buffer turned off. We also have an output enable input that we need to consider. Now this is an active low signal, so if we have a low signal coming in here, it will activate this AND gate along with the direction. So we need the direction set to 1 and the output enable set to 0, and then this tri-state buffer will be active. Our A can then pass through the tri-state buffer and output to B. So I will permanently set the direction input to high, and I can turn the output from our add submodule on and off by setting the output enable appropriately. Now this is an 8-bit module, and so this is just showing one of the transceivers here, a 1-bit transceiver. We have seven more down here, so there are a total of 8 bits. So I'll need four of these modules for the 32-bit output of our add submodule. Now if I scroll to the right, I've already added this in. I have a 32-bit tri-state buffer here. It's receiving the sum output from the adder as input and producing a result. And this will be the 32-bit ALU result. If we have a look in here, we can see that we have the 8-bit 748C245 chips that we were just looking at. We have the A inputs, our B outputs. We have our direction, so the A to B on this diagram was the DIR input in our data sheet. I've just set that to VCC, set it high so it's always going from A to B. And then I have an enable low signal coming in here. All four of them are then wired up in the same way. I'll quickly add this into the Verilog simulation to make sure that we're consistent between the circuit and the add sub module. I'll need an additional input for our enable signal. And I'll make a comment here saying that this is enabled low. We'll also need to separate out the result of the adder from the result of the ALU. So I'll add an extra wire here for the result from the adder. And I'll call that adder out. And we'll wire that into our adder module as the output. And the last thing to do is to assign the adder output to a result, but to conditionally assign it. The condition is based on whether or not we are enabled. So if enable is true, uh, is a high value, then we actually want to output a high impedance, meaning we're disabling this output. We can do that using the Z designation in Verilog. I've expressed it here as a hex number, so the H here is for hex. Since this is hex, each of these Zs actually represents four Z bits, four high impedance bits, so I've got eight of them there to get our 32. If our enable signal is low, then we are enabled and we need to output our adder. And that's it, that's all the changes that we need to the module. So now when we set the enable low, we'll get the adder output. When we set it high, it will disable this output and allow us to drive that result signal from a different module. I'll just stick that into our test bench here. I'll add the enable signal and I'll just turn it on. And then we'll run again to make sure that that's outputting correctly. Okay, of course, I've got a syntax error in my port declaration. Let's have a look at that right up on line... Uh, we 
have line one and line eight. Of course, I have a typo here, so that's easy to fix. And I've got the wrong number of ports, so I've forgotten to put that into here. Our enable signal should be coming in here as well. Okay, so now we've got our result. We're running the test. This is the same test that we ran previously. We can see that all of our outputs are coming through correctly. So the result is our third option here, uh, our third output here. So we have zero plus zero, and then we have our result in this column here. They're all still working, so let's just test again with a disabled output. And we can see that we have Zs down here. So our Verilog module is working. We've updated the schematic. The last thing now to do is to prepare the PCB and get that ordered. As you can see, I've gone ahead and developed the PCB here. And I'll be honest, this is the most complicated PCB I've had to wire up. There are five 32-bit buses. We have the A, B, and result bus. We also have that intermediate adder output. And then we also have the connection between our inverting XOR gates, if you remember those. You can see that I've put a PCI Express connector on the bottom and they have 164 pins. So that's enough for me to be able to connect this up to other modules within the CPU. And that's easier to see if I jump over to the 3D viewer. You can see that I have the PCI Express card edge connector here, and that will slot into a PCI Express card. The PCI Express slot looks something like this, and the card edge can fit into that. You, you can see that the one that I've got here has rows of pins that are quite narrow, and that's so that they can fit onto the top of the board. So the top of the board will have the PCI Express socket uh, soldered up to either side of the board like this, and then the next module can clip into that. And that way I can connect a whole range of these modules. So as I complete the ALU, they'll all clip in together and the appropriate one will be activated and the result uh, produced. So I'll order this board and then we'll have a closer look at it and test if it works. The PCB has arrived along with all the components. So it's time to get soldering. Now, I have to confess, my surface mount soldering skills are terrible. So please don't take anything you see as a guide on how to solder small components. In fact, if you have any suggestions on how I can improve, by all means, let me know. I've soldered up as much as I can here, but you'll notice that uh, I haven't soldered up the buffers here. So this, these are the buffers, the four chips down here. Unfortunately, the package that they sent me was not the same size as all of the other chips. They're all advertised as SO packages, small outline packages, but unfortunately they didn't give me dimensions or data sheets, so I couldn't uh, be sure what size these were and I used the wrong footprint. I thought I'd used one that was big enough in case the chip was a different size, but these are about as big an SO package as you can get. So I'll definitely need a version 2.0 of this board. Also, these LEDs are back to front, which was a bit of a stupid mistake. Um, subtract is carry and carry is subtract. And my A and B labels are back to front. All of those are not enough to stop me from testing the board, though. You can see that the output here is still being driven, and that's because it's coming from the sum. It's not coming as the output from the buffer. So whatever sum these adders here are producing will be presented on the LED display. But I need some way of driving these input pins here. So I need to specify the A and B values, each of which are 32 bits. So that's very difficult to control. You'll notice that if I just touch these pins here, then the output changes. And that's because the pins are currently floating. So in the next video, I'll be building a module specifically for testing this, and I'll drive the A and B inputs. I'll specify whether or not we are subtracting.